So there's a story of these two twin brothers, and they were always getting into trouble. They were about seven years of age, and whenever there was something that was going on in town, uh, any kind of trouble, the parents knew that it was probably their kids. And so the mother had heard that the preacher at the local church had a good track record of helping uh, getting kids disciplined and getting back straight up and back in order. And so she called the pastor and asked, could you meet with my sons because they just caused trouble. And so um, he said, absolutely, but I'm going to meet with them one-on-one. And so he had the first twin come, the first brother come, and uh, he sat him down, and he asked the kid a question, and the preacher was kind of had a booming voice. He was a big, burly guy, and he he asked the, the kid, he said, do you know where God is, son? And the kid didn't answer a word. And so the preacher was like, okay, let me take this further. And he lifted up his voice a little louder and a little more preachier. And he said, where is God? And the kid did not answer him a word. He was just like kind of just staring at him. And one more time, the preacher, even louder with more of a booming preacher voice, he said, where is God? And at that moment, the kid ran out of the room. He screamed. He yelled. And he was like, oh, my gosh. And he ran home. And he went upstairs. And he hid in the closet. And his twin brother, they were looking for him. They finally found him. And he he said, what happened? What happened? And the kid was crying in the closet. He said, oh, my gosh, we're in big trouble. God is missing. And they think we did it. Well, how many know God's not missing? That God is here right now. And we're going to conclude this series on encountering the Father. And the scripture that we use was from Luke chapter 2, and I want to read that verse to you one more time, verses 48 through 50. It says in that scripture, so when they saw him, they were amazed, speaking of Jesus. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business, but they didn't understand the statement which he spoke to them. I must be about my father's business. Can somebody say my father's business? It's warm already. There was a key statement that we had for the month that I want to read, and we've been reading it. It kind of rhymes, and so you can read it with me if you want to, and uh, every time we get together, we kind of have these key statements, key verses, and so here's the key statement for this series, The Encountering the Father, and by the way, is there an amen in this room? Is there a praise the Lord in this room? Can somebody lift up your hand and say, thank you, Jesus? Okay, I just want to make sure, because we, we had such a good time in the first service. The second service is the, is the service that got the most sleep, so you guys are wide awake, so we're going to have a good time. Somebody might get up and run around the aisles, and who knows what's going to happen up in here. Amen? Is that okay? Can we have a good time in the house of the Lord? Amen. That's what we got to do. But um, we're going to read this. Let's read this together. In this time, you can read with me if you like. We're going to go further in our holy fervor for our heavenly father. Every righteous son and supernatural daughter will know a new intimacy and we will see some mysteries become history as we meet the source of our identity, our stability, our prosperity, and our destiny. So in the month of February, we cry out, Abba, Father, G-O-D to the first person of the Trinity. He's going to meet us differently. His healing is going to be our reality. His joy is going to give us the victory. His spirit is going to cause a new activity in our life and ministry. This is our Holy Father Litany. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your word. Speak today for your servants are listening. We tune our ears to hear what you're saying and what you're doing in this hour. We want to be in the light as you are in the light. We want to move with you and flow with you and do what you've called us to do in this time. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And somebody said, can you wave your hand and say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. 
Ooh, I'm excited. Well, we are ending this series, and as we conclude this series, you know, Paul in, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18 is a very interesting because we, we talked about it today. People always say, where's the Trinity in Scripture? Well, there's a lot of Scriptures with the Trinity. You just look at the water baptism of Jesus. There was a voice coming out of heaven that was booming saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then you have the Son coming out of the water, and as he comes out of the water, there's a dove, the Holy Spirit, that descends upon him. And there's so many scriptures about the Trinity, the three, the triune God. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18 and 19, Paul begins to talk about, he says, through him, somebody say Jesus, through him we both have access by one spirit, somebody say the Holy Spirit, to the heavenly Father. Did you see that right there? By him, who? Jesus. We have access by the Holy Spirit, one spirit to the Father. And, and he says in verse 19, now therefore you are no longer, can I make an announcement to somebody up in here? You are no longer, say I am no longer. See, see he's breaking some stuff off. You are no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The word household in the Greek is patria. Patria is derived from the Greek word for father, which is pater. And so pater is the source of the patria, the house, the family. And we are members of the household of God. Can somebody say, yeah, yeah, yeah. In Ephesians chapter 3, the next chapter, the Apostle Paul says in verse 14 and 15, I told you I'm going to give you some scripture up in here. He said, for this reason, I bow my knees to the pater, to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family, the patria, the family in heaven and earth is named. We are named after our heavenly father. And, 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 and family comes from fatherhood because the father is the source and he's the source of our spiritual family. And so the primary feature of family is father. And so God came to reveal himself not just as your sustainer, not just as your provider, not just as Shama, the God who is there, not just as Adonai and Elohim, but he came to reveal himself as Abba Father, G-O-D, the father of this family. Can somebody say amen? And so we are members of the same family. Look around this room at all these people. We're all in the same family. Isn't this a beautiful family? I think our family is the best looking family in the whole wide world. Come on, somebody. And family is not, de is, it's not denomination. It's not organization. It's not institution. Family is family by its life source, and its life source is the Father. And so one of the things that Jesus came to teach us is that we have two types of relationships. Relationship, a relationship that is vertical and relationships that are horizontal. Our relationship with God is vertical. It is vertical. We have a vertical relationship with him, and we have a horizontal relationship with each other. That's why if the world's going to know that we're of Jesus and we have Jesus, they're going to know it by our love for one another. And one of the things God's going to work on in this hour is his church. Because we've missed the boat on some things and we're all divided about this and that. And God wants to raise up a bride and a church without spot or wrinkle in this time. And so you look in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. Let me just give you some background then I'm going to get into this word here. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, what does the scripture say? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. How many heard that scripture before? Jesus is teaching us how to pray. Well, what are the first two words? Our Father. This is a very simple but powerful phrase. Our, our Father. But, but let's talk about our. It's all together. This is not about exclusivity. This is about family. And he's our father. But it's interesting in the Greek because when you read it, it doesn't say our father. It says father our. Because what is it when you, because in English we have it flipped around, our father. It makes sense in our brain. But in Greek it's actually father our. <laughs> Why? Because it's an order of priority. Father, vertical, our, 
horizontal. Father, our. There's something about a relationship that we have with him that affects our relationship with one another. That's why we're believing for health in the house of God. We're believing for people to get healed from church. Or, there's an amen somewhere in here. And get healed from religiosity. Get re- healed from, from bad experiences and come into a place where you are whole and you move into wholeness and wholeness is a precursor to fullness. And I don't believe that people have been able to step into fullness because their wholeness is incomplete. And so we got to get whole, we got to get healed, we got to get restored, we got to get set free, we got to get delivered. There's an amen somewhere up in this room. You got We got to get that way so we can move from wholeness into fullness. You cannot operate fully, now he's preaching, into who you're supposed to be until you are complete. And so God says, I'm taking all the fragments, I'm taking all the pain, I'm taking all the hurts, I'm taking all the years and the fears and the tears that have held you back, and I'm going to bring healing into your life, and you will be healed, says the Lord. So you remember, we are children of the living God. And so, so, so in this series, we, we, we brought out a few different points. We talked about that the Father is the source. He's the source of our identity. Somebody say, who I am. He's the source of my stability, what I'm anchored to. He's the source of my prosperity, what I have. And today we're concluding the series, he's the source of my destiny, where this is going. This is going somewhere. You didn't just, you weren't just living in this life just to suck air. But you have a purpose because when we talk about destiny, we talk about purpose. God is a God of purpose. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a people. And he has a purpose for your days. You didn't just, you just weren't created because two people got together. Come on, somebody. And they did that thing. And and then you were, you were, you, you, you all of a sudden were, came into being. No, 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 no. God had a purpose for your days. No matter how you got here, you are here. And by God's grace, you are here. Come on, somebody. And because of his love, you are here. And you have a purpose for your days. And there's a destiny for your life. Can somebody say amen? So you got to understand that you have a purpose. Somebody say, I have a purpose. Somebody say, I have a destiny. And guess what? There's something about your destiny that's very important. Because there's, the old, there's a phrase, choice, not chance, determines destiny. How many have ever heard that before? You don't just stumble into your destiny. It's not a happenstance type of thing. Ha. Choice. You are here by God's choice. He decided that you're going to be here. And one thing about your destiny is this. And your purpose in your life is it can go one way or it can go another. How many know what I'm talking about? Because you make a choice. Adam and Eve were called to be in the garden. And they were called to turn the whole earth into a garden. But because of choice, somebody say choice. They took a bite of that fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God told them not to touch it. How many know there's something about human nature? When somebody tells you not to do something, there's this temptation all of a sudden to do it. But God said, don't touch it. But because of choice, somebody say choice. All of a sudden, all of mankind fell into sin because of choice. In Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to start preaching in a minute. Don't watch out. In Genesis chapter 12, God told Abram, he said, get out of your country and go to a place called Colleen. I mean, go to a place that I'm going to show you, and it's going to be a promised land. It's going to be a blessed land. And everywhere you go, those who bless you will be blessed, and those who cursed you will be cursed. And out of you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And Abraham had to make a choice. In Hebrews chapter 11, he said, by faith, Abraham went out. Not knowing where he was going, but he made a choice by faith. Choice is important. Joseph made a choice. When Potiphar's wife was starting to talk all sweet to him. What's up, Jojo? (laughs) 
And she's all talking sweet. And he had to sit there and say, you know what? My destiny is greater than a one night stand. And I'm not going to give up my purpose for a bowl of porridge like Esau. There's something inside of me that says, that's sweet, you're nice, you're, but see you later, hasta la vista, baby. He made a choice. Can somebody say choice? Choice, not chance, determines destiny. And Moses made a choice. When God told him, go into Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. He made a choice. Joshua made a choice with Caleb when they went into the promised land. And they spied out the land. And they stood against the majority. Sometimes you have to stand against the majority. It was ten against two. And they stood up against the voice of the majority. The voice of the majority said, we can't do it. The giants are too big. The walled cities are too high. Their armies are too strong. And Caleb and Joshua had a Holy Ghost attitude. See, some of you need to get a little more attitude. With the enemy of your soul, the enemy of your purpose, and the enemy of your destiny. And you need to say, you know what? Let's go, and let's go right now. Let's take the land. I ain't afraid of no giants. I ain't afraid of no armies. I ain't afraid of no enemies. Bring them on. Bring their wall cities on. Let's do this. Can somebody say, let's do this? See, they had to make a choice. Esther had to make a choice. Esther had to make a choice. <laughs> choose, Esther, choose. Because if you make this wrong decision, you and your family are going to perish. But who knows if you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. You need to stand up against Haman, make a choice. Ha, Jesus made a choice. I think one of the most profound moments in Scripture is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here he is sweating blood out of his forehead and he comes to a place and he makes a choice and he says to the father in prayer not my will but your will be done but first of all before he said that he was sitting there contemplating like you know what if this cup could pass from me this is Jesus but then he finally made a decision not my will but your will be done. Can somebody say that? Not. See, see, you can make a wrong choice like Lot. You can make a wrong choice like Judas. And it's still a destiny. But it's not necessarily your destiny. Well, I'm talking to somebody up in here. And so you have to make the right choice for your destiny. Destiny is purpose. Destiny is your calling, and you are not here by mistake. And your destiny can go one way, or it can go another way by choice. There's a church in, I mean a church, a, a courthouse in the state of Ohio, and I found out there's some Ohio ends here. Anybody else, any from the Buckeye State? Oh, Buckeyes, okay. There's a few. Oh, Ohio, all right, represent Ohio. There's a courthouse in Ohio that's geographically significant because when the rain falls upon the north side of the building, the water drops, the raindrops run down, and they fall and they go into Lake Ontario. And from Lake Ontario, they fall, flow into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. But if the rain falls on the south side, the raindrops go a different way. They fall down and they flow over to the great Mississippi River and flow all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And just by one of wind, a destiny is determined. If the rain ends up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence or if the rain ends up and flows into the Gulf of Mexico. Just one win. Just one choice. Choice, not chance, determines destiny. Can somebody hear what I'm saying up in here? And, and so I want to show you three things that will get you moving in the right direction. Are you ready for this? 
And I'm only going to get through one and two real quick because I've got to get to three. In the first service, I only got to one. They didn't even hear two and three. But I'm going to get to three here today. Because there are three things that push you into your destiny. Because it can go one way or it can go another. And you look and the first one is appreciate. Somebody say appreciate. See, God wants to teach us how to appreciate our destiny. To appreciate what he has given. Can somebody say appreciate? To appreciate means to value, to be grateful for, to be pleased, to be joyful, to, be, to appreciate. To appreciate is powerful because your destiny is unique. I told the first service, you're not a freak, but you are unique. And you are called. And God's hand is on your life. And God put everything you in a place. I told him in Genesis, you can watch it in the service, Genesis chapter 1. God puts you in a place where you have everything you need in order to accomplish everything you're supposed to do. Your destiny is fully equipped by God. And so God puts you up in here in this place and he gave you the relationships and the giftings and the callings and the talents and the abilities to fulfill your purpose. Like I said earlier, you're not called to just sit around and just do life and to just suck air and do life and get a job and maybe get a spouse and maybe have some kiddos, and maybe eventually have some grandkids, and then die. That's not what you're called to do. You're called to touch people, to bring as many people to heaven with you as you possibly can. When you get to heaven, can you imagine people just coming up, lining up for days? Thank you. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Here's my family. Here's my grandkids. We're all here because of you. Can you imagine being in heaven? Because this is an eternal perspective that God wants to give us. When you have an eternal perspective, it gives you an internal objective that your external is going to be effective. So everywhere you go, you spread the goodness of Jesus. And so when you begin to appreciate, and I talked about this in the first service, when you begin to appreciate your destiny, when you begin to appreciate your purpose, you walk different. You talk different. You show up to work different. Come on, somebody. Let it be said of the people of Karis Church that we are at work on time. Two amens from over here if not early, and that we are faithful in our work and in our labors because we're not just representing ourselves and we're not just out there getting a paycheck. Is this real talk up in here? But we are representatives of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, and everything you put your hand to do will prosper. Every environment that you, because you appreciate your destiny. I'm a child of the living king. I am his. I am the apple of his eye. I have been chosen and accepted and I am loved by my daddy. And so I walk like I'm loved and I talk like I've been chosen and I move around and I think like I've been accepted by the God of all creation, the God of the universe. And I face temptation with an appreciation of my destiny. I face struggle and trials with an appreciation of my destiny. And so I'm not going to fail because I've been anointed. There's some people in this room, you've been anointed. God's anointing is on your life to change atmospheres. And so you are called to appreciate. Can somebody say appreciate? The second one is recalibrate. And I can't get into recalibrate. I was going to. I'll have to do this another time because I want to get to the third one for a second. But recalibrate. I mean, here's my phone, right? And there's this British lady who talks on the phone in the maps. And as long as I'm driving right, make a left turn. Put a cowboy in there, right? Some, something from the south. Make a left turn over yonder. <laughs> but there's this British lady at my phone, and she's always talking, and 
And she gets to a certain point where maybe I get off track. Has anyone ever been on the maps and but you got off track? And then what does she start saying? Recalibrating, recalibrating, recalibrating. And the Lord began to speak to me in this last season, and he's speaking to a whole company of people about your destiny. And so people have gotten off track. You've gotten off the road. And there's this word from the Holy Spirit, recalibrating, recalibrating. And so you're supposed to do one, two, three, but somehow you went one over here, two, three, four, five. And Holy Spirit saying, recalibrating, recalibrating. I'm trying to get you back on track, recalibrating. And God's getting some people back, and he's recalibrating some people in this season. And he's recalibrating your destiny. So i got to make an announcement for some people, even if you feel like it has gotten off track, you got the Holy Spirit who has your back. And he's even going to take care of you in the midst of your lack. And he's going to get you back on track, Jack. He's getting you back. He's recalibrating, recalibrating, recalibrating. Now let me get to the third word. Somebody just say appreciate, recalibrate. And last one, demonstrate. Demonstrate. Are you awake in here? Demonstrate is a powerful word. It speaks of moving from inaction to action. This is an hour where God's calling his church to action. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. The Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of Karis Church. What if there was a book that was written? The book of Acts, of Karis Church, of the miracles, of the signs, of the wonders, of the salvations, of the turning of cities, and the turning of hearts. What if there was a book of Acts demonstrate, a demonstration of a move of God? During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln sat down and he wrote a letter to General McClelland. And he wanted to communicate with General McClelland because at that time, General McClelland was leading the armies of the North against the South. And they were at a particular battlefield in the war. And General McClelland was sitting with his army on one side and the southern army was sitting at the other side of this battlefield and days went by and even weeks went by and general i mean a president lincoln got a report that they were in the midst of a waiting campaign and so abraham lincoln wrote a letter to general mcclellan and he said I heard that you are in a waiting campaign, and if you won't use your army, then I should try and borrow them for a while from you, because they were in a waiting campaign. You know, there's a certain point where God says, I didn't call you to be in a waiting campaign. I did not anoint you to sit on your anointed hands. When those hands are supposed to lay hands on the sick and cause them to recover. I did not call you. I did not gift you. I did not give you abilities and talents and wherewithal and resources and, 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 and relationships for you to sit on your hands and say, I'm in a waiting campaign. God's speaking a word to the church in this time. And he says, General McClellan, I'm going to go ahead and borrow your army. I'm going to go ahead and borrow the church. I'm going to use the church because the church is coming, come on somebody, out of a place of being in a waiting campaign. In 1 Samuel 17, watch this. I'm going to show you this story real quick. Demonstrate. Somebody say demonstrate. In 1 Samuel 17, we have a waiting campaign. King Saul and the army of Israel is on this one side of the valley of Elah. And Goliath and the Philistines, how many know this story, are on the other side of the valley of Elah. And they're in a waiting 
campaign. Here they are waiting because they are afraid. Saul is afraid of this giant named Goliath. And G Goliath and the Philistines are afraid of God's covenant people. And so there's this waiting game that is going on in this moment. And then along comes... The shepherd boy with a sling. Woo. And he arrives at the battlefield and he takes an assessment of what is going on. And this young man is not about waiting in waiting campaigns. When a lion showed up, if he tried to outweigh the lion, he would have been eaten by the lion. If he tried to outweigh the, weight the bear, I'm talking to somebody up in here, the bear would have attacked him and mauled him and eaten him and his sheep. He was not into waiting campaigns. So along comes this servant, David, who has the original DoorDash, Uber Eats, order, to bring cheese and bread to his brothers. And so he rolls up in his Hyundai, kicks out of my Honda, and he pulls up and he looks at what's going on and he's like, hey, brothers, what's going on? Oh, we're in a waiting campaign. Oh, what? And then he says, let me talk to King Saul. And he goes up to King Saul and says, King Saul, what's going on here? Why isn't anybody fighting with this, this uncircumcised Philistine? Can somebody say that? Uncircumcised Philistine. He's talking to the king. And David, David's going up and he's just got this, he's got this swag, this attitude, this street in him. Where he's like, walk, he's walking up into the midst of an army and a king. And he's sitting there saying, Wait a second, he's calling names. He's, he's talking smack. He's got his sling. And he knows how to use it. And he's like, wait a second. How dare this uncircumcised Philistine defy God and the armies of God? How in the world are we in a waiting campaign. Huh. I'm going to have to demonstrate my destiny. And so all of a sudden he has this attitude and he's like, you know what? I'm sorry, but Jehovah is with us. God is with us. And there ain't no enemy. There ain't no foe. There ain't no giant that can stand up against us. And so David has like this attitude. Can I impart some Davidic attitude up in here to the church where somebody just rises up and says, enough is enough. You get your foot like this and you put it down and you say, enough is enough. See, somebody needs to put your foot down in this place and say, enough is enough. Come on, get your foot up. Let's try it. One, two, three. Enough is enough. Get off my family. Get off my children, get off my grandchildren, get off my health, get off of my money, get out of the city of Colleen right now, get out of Texas. Enemy, you got to get out of the United States of America. Enough is enough. Somebody's got to get an attitude up in here. And you can sit there and look at it and say, you know what? Who are you, you uncircumcised Philistine? You see, why did David say that? Why did he say, you uncircumcised Philistine? This is the way he talks right here. And he's going to say, because God's going to deliver you into my hands. Basically, what he was saying is this. You are uncircumcised. Meaning, it's a sign that you are not in covenant with God. And so I'm going to make an announcement 
to you because I'm going to declare in your ear my advantage. You see, I got to prophesy and declare to somebody in this place that you have an advantage over the enemy. You are connected to the God who is seated on the throne. He is high and lifted up, and the train of his robe fills the temple. And he's got angelic backup who are just waiting in the room declaring, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You've got armies backing you up. Can I just pray for your eyes, Gehazi? Can I pray that God would open up your eyes to see that there are more with you than are against you? And even though you're surrounded by armies, there are chariots of fire that are surrounding you in this moment. You have an advantage. And I'm prophesying to somebody up in here, you're walking around with an advantage and you don't even know it. And basically, but David's like this, <laughs> you're outside covenant relationship. Well, how am I going to beat you? Why am I going to beat you? Because you're outside. So I'm going to look at you with your armor and look at you with your helmet and look at you with your breastplate. And I'm looking at you with your sword and your spear and your shield. But you are in a no covenant position. Basically, you are helmetless. <laughs> you are breastplate less. You are shield less. You are spear and sword less. Guess what, enemy? I got an announcement for you because you are not in covenant, but I am. You uncircumcised Philistine. David was just spewing out words in this moment, and he basically told him, he said this, you uncircumcised Philistine today. Somebody say today. Because somebody say today. That means right now. I am. I'm going to remove your head from your neck and I'm going to feed your flesh to the fowls of the air. See, David wasn't playing up in there. He wasn't interested in a waiting campaign. Let's just wait and see what they do. Oh my goodness. Oh, they blinked. Oh my goodness. Oh no, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your brothers and we'll kill your army. Because you defied the army of God. This is Old Testament, I know. But he's sitting there saying, I'm going to take you out. There's something in his spirit. When he heard the name of God being defiled by this giant, where he said, this is not, uh, 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 not on my watch. Yeah, you better start playing for me because I'm going to, uh, you could just give me some organ or something right there. Just dun, dun, dun. Yeah, like that. <laughs> Woo. And so David looks, he reaches into his pouch. The word reach in the Hebrew is shalak, different shalak. This is S-H-A-L-A-C-H, shalak. It means to send. He sent his hand into his pouch. He pulled out a stone. You know what I have right here? This is really fun. I like to go to Israel with my wife. I got a stone from the Valley of Elah right here in my hand. From the same place where David picked up the stones. See that stone right there? And he took that stone and he put it in the sling. You know this story. He began to swing. And all of a sudden he released. And one little stone went and it flew through the air hit the giant in the forehead. First came the bear, then came the lion. Down goes the giant. Down goes the giant. Down goes the giant. And guess what? The waiting campaign was over. I want to speak a prophetic word over this region right now. The waiting campaign is over. I'm going to share something that I shared in the first service, and I'll close. Because all of a sudden, David became famous. Because he demonstrated his destiny. Can I prophesy to somebody in this room? It's time to demonstrate 
your destiny. <laughs> okay, I'll try over here. It's time to demonstrate your destiny. Okay, let me try over here. It's time to demonstrate your destiny. It's time to demonstrate your destiny. This is not just a, a regular little sermon. This is a call to action. It's a call to movement. I'm going to read a text that I got last night from a man named Steve Williams. Steve Williams is a pastor who introduced us to a pastor named Gary Hay. Pastor Gary Hay was the one who introduced us to a church called Grace Christian Center, which is now Karis Church. And so this man who sent me this text last night was a divine connector. Let me tell you something. You're stepping through a season where God's going to put divine connectors in your life. Where he's going to open up doors for you. Is there anyone who needs an open door? Just raise your hand. Okay. Divine connectors are being released right now in your life. Here, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. You need an open door. There's an open door. Because what, what does the scripture say in Revelation chapter 3? I set before you an open door. A door that no man can close. Whew, no man can shut this door. And no man can open it. It's a God thing. And for some reason in the last season, for some of you, can I speak prophetically now? There's been doors that have been shut. And those doors that have been shut didn't feel good. They shut off certain things. They shut off resource, finance, opportunity, even relationships. But the Spirit of the Lord comes and says, I let some of those doors shut on purpose. So I want to bring resolution to you today, says the Lord. I'm bringing resolution to your heart so you can just move to the next. Because you're not going to be able to move to the next door. I know you're in the hallway. But you're not going to move through the next door until you just release that last door. Let it go. Release it now. Because there's something better in store. That last season was just preparatory for what you're about to step into. So you had to gain some muscle. You had to gain some whoo, strength. But God lets you go through it because there's something better that's in store. And so there's a people in this room right now, you have your hand raised and you're like, you know what? I need a divine connector. There's divine connectors being released right now. Opportunities are open. Applications are being filled out. Grants are being released to people right now. Finances are coming your way. Businesses that, that seem like they were dead are coming back to life right now in Jesus' name. Watch and see. Open door. Open door. Somebody say open door. So one of my divine connectors sent me this text last night because if I didn't know this man and he didn't know the man that set us up, we wouldn't be here right now. But look at Jesus. And he sent me this text about a conversation that he had with a prophet named David Shock. David Shock was from Fort Worth, Texas. David Shock was a man that prophesied over me when I was 11 days old. I was on life support, my lungs were premature. And the doctor called my father on the 11th day and said, turn off the machines, your son's not going to make it. Right after that doctor called, this man, David Shock, who he's talking about, called and he said, here's the word of the Lord. Your son is not going to die, but he's going to live to preach and prophesy the word of the Lord. And within 18 hours, he will be breathing on his own. Well, you see what happened. The doctor gave his report, and then the Lord gave his report. And then the question to you is, is whose report are you going to believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. At the 17-hour mark, the doctor called my father and said, you're not going to believe this. It's a miracle. Your son's breathing on his own. And my dad said, yes, that's a miracle. <laughs> He's breathing on his own. And this man 
Steve Williams was talking about this man who prophesied over me. And he said this, and I want you to hear this because here's what God's about to do. He said, I sat with David Schock, the prophet, a notable prophet in the movement about 30 years ago, and asked him about huh, the end time movement of the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget David looking at me with his piercing eyes and saying, watch this, there are generations of prayers living in heaven for that will affect what happens on the earth. He said there will be an outpouring. Watch this, watch this, watch this. There will be an outpouring of the Spirit far greater than what we had recorded in the book of Acts. He said to me, we have given our lives to see a glorious church arise in the earth. God will not disappoint us. He said, we're living in a time, watch this, and I want you to hear this very clearly, demonstrate. We're living in a time of accelerated reaping. There's a harvest appointed to us. We're living under the influence, watch this, the influence of generations of prayer that are still alive in heaven right now. And then Pastor Steve said, for my prayer for you and Karis tonight is your eyes will be turned towards heaven. May your hearts be filled with heaven's expectations and atmosphere. Let heaven's anointing saturate you and your church tomorrow. The best days are in front of us. Jesus paid for what we will experience. I'm telling you, church, we're moving into an hour of demonstration. Father, woo, is the source of our destiny. And he releases us now into our purpose. And our purpose is not just to appreciate. Our purpose is not just to recalibrate. Our purpose is to demonstrate. And I'm telling you, this is an hour of demonstration of the power of God in the earth. You are anointed. I got to get up here. I said, you are anointed. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And that Holy Spirit is the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. You have resurrection life in your life. And so you go up on out of here and you go to the restaurant and you walk in an assignment now. You're walking in purpose now. Go ahead and order your food, but look around the room and say, Jesus who would you have me share love to today and speak a word of encouragement today? Walk into the grocery store. Don't just go to H-E-B, looking at your list. Look up. Look around. Find somebody who needs the love of Jesus and spread his love everywhere you go. And if somebody doesn't want it, Take back your peace. That's what Jesus said. Everywhere you go, say shalom. And they say, go away. Take my shalom with me. You can't have that. You read Luke chapter 10. Is it Luke chapter 10? If they, if, if they don't want dust the... <laughs> Come on, shalom. Because we ain't playing. But at the same time, God's going to use you. Demonstrate. You're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. Demonstrate. You're going to speak a word of life to somebody who's discouraged today. Demonstrate. God's going to show you somebody who's contemplating suicide. Demonstrate. You are a walking divine appointment everywhere you go. Demonstrate. Everywhere you go, you're walking in triumphal procession. Demonstrate. You're spreading the fragrance of Christ. Demonstrate. This is what the church is called to do. That word said this. We're moving into an end time 
movement of the Holy Spirit. Somebody's going to catch the wave. And there's going to be an accelerated reaping of the harvest in Jesus' name. Somebody say, demonstrate. I was not called to just suck air. I was not just called just to make it into heaven. If I just got my ticket into heaven, I've been called to bring a whole lot of people to heaven with me. And even though I make my bed in hell and I'm in the atmosphere of hell, I'm calling down heaven everywhere I go. I'm handing out heaven. I'm not a dope dealer. I'm a hope dealer. I'm walking around handing out heaven, 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 heaven. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus.